Hello, party people. I fell asleep last night, during which, in the middle of the night, Joe and Matt put me in a bag, and they brought me to this room. I feel like I've been here before, but it's been a long time. Come with me. Let's sing a song together.
Decided to move in the direction of going live each Sunday morning at 11.15. We'll see how it goes. I hope you enjoy it and appreciate it. It's so good to have at least a few people to gather together to worship God in this wonderful place. A couple of announcements as we get started this morning of things that I'd like to share with you. The first is, is that many of us have been greatly in, involved in so many things throughout the time. We're making adjustments for our live streams for both services. Please bear with us as we do so as we seek to try to provide the best possible opportunities for worship with sound and with the visual arts and different things that we're going to incorporate in. It's a wonderful opportunity for ongoing future ministry here at Ardmore. I want to thank you for bearing with us through it all. In the midst of this pandemic season, many of us have not, as you know, been able to gather together for worship and also to give whatever ties and gifts and promises and commitments we've made to the church. And so I solicit you to please mail in your tithe or mail in whatever gifts that you may see fit in order that we might continue to do the wonderful ministries of the church. We also have an online vehicle available for you if you'd like to give to the church through our website. Uh, if you'll click on the link for giving, and it is a very secure and wonderful opportunity for us to give to the wonderful ministries of the church. As we're unable to gather together for worship, but we can continue to give in many different ways. And I thank you in advance for that. I also want to thank those who were involved in the maker boxes of, uh, for Moore Elementary School, a wonderful partnership. Your gifts of those boxes or your gifts towards those boxes provide a wonderful head start for kids in our neighborhood and in the community as their school season begins in a different way. But you've provided a way in which they can do something and learn from home with your willingness to give. We also want to thank those involved in the church-wide movie night this past Friday evening. 
where we watched the movie Selma, and then there were a number of people who were involved in a conversation afterwards. I want to thank those who participated throughout the summer as we focused in for our church-wide movie night in areas of racial reconciliation so that we might be the church that God has called us to be, a church that's for all people, that's open and aware of the nuances of our lives and our faith and how God can continually shape and mold and change our lives to be more loving and caring and also to seek justice for those in our world. Next Sunday uh, is Giving Sunday in the life of the church, the final Sunday of each month throughout this pandemic era. We've had a Giving Sunday. It's an opportunity for members of our church or even from our community to come by the church and drive through the parking lot. If you have the opportunity to give towards the ministries of the church, that's great. But if not, please receive a gift of a blessing from us of those who are gathered there to serve you at that time. We will be serving ice cream and dipping dots as well. And it's a little bit different this, this coming week because in addition to that, we'll be having music available by Jerry Chapman. And we've, our time has changed as well. Our time will be from 4 o'clock to 6 p.m. So please come and drive through the parking lot and, they, and invite your neighbors and your friends to come. Receive some ice cream or dipping Dots and then park, open the windows of your car and listen and share a socially distanced opportunity for us to gather in at least the same area. There are many other opportunities and things that we have for your ability to give towards our Father's Table. Uh, closing closet is currently closed, but we are continuing to provide food and other necessary items for members of our community. Currently, we need diapers for ages 3 to 6 and also adult diapers. So if you have the opportunity to purchase those, or also non-perishable items that we can use to replenish our blessing box, we would greatly appreciate it. In the midst of these challenging times, we at Ardmore have done everything we can to try and connect to God, connect to each other, and connect to the world. And therefore, we've provided a number of different live stream opportunities, whether it's at 10 a.m. worship, whether it's 11.15 a.m. worship, whether it's our Zoomity group that meets at 9 a.m. on Sunday, but also Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with our morning prayer, and Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. with telling our stories, getting to know our staff here at Arlington. I hope that you'll continue to join us for the opportunities, these wonderful opportunities, but also continue to invite your neighbors and your friends as we seek to connect in every way that we can. We've gathered together today to worship God and to give thanks and praise to God. For God has blessed us immensely in more ways than we'll ever know. And therefore, let us continue worshiping together as we open our time with God in prayer. As we continue in our worship to a time of prayer, I invite you to take that deep breath of the day and relax your shoulders as we pray for our church and for our world. Let us pray. God of unknown times, hear us as we pray. For those who are fearful of their lives, for those who are fearful of the lives of family members and friends, for those who are fearful, we pray. For those who have cried themselves to sleep most nights. For those who have cried after teaching their first online class. For those who have just cried to cry, we pray. For those who are lost learning a new skill. For those who have lost themselves during abrupt change in their lives. And for those who are lost, we pray. For those wishing to go back in time, and for those wishing things were different, for those just wishing for normalcy, we pray. And for those who are numb to it all, for those who are trying to make the best out of it, and for those who have stopped pretending to be okay when they're not, we pray. Holy God, you hold all of these persons and all of us in your comforting presence. And guide us in this honest work of authenticity in a time of uncertainty. And be with us as we continue to move together in an unknown world. We pray these things in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. Let us listen to God's word and ask for it to speak to us at this time and in this place. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they said, and then they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say? That I am. Simon Peter answered, You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, in this time, in this wonderful place, might your words be my words as I seek to proclaim your good news for each of us. For it's in the power and the spirit of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So the title of my sermon today is The Roller Coaster of Life and of Faith. And I believe that a roller coaster is a wonderful analogy for our lives and for our faith. And it reminds me of the story of when Amanda and I got married and we took our kids to Disney World. I will go ahead and say that Disney World was one of the most wonderful, amazing things for us and our children. And also one of the most stressful. Just imagine two parents with four children, aged six, five, and four years old, having to walk through the crowds of Disney World holding on to each of them for dear life in fear that they would either wander off or that someone would snatch them up. We enjoyed Disney World in so many ways as a family. We talked to them as we're on the airplane going down. Even my brother-in-law had shared how awesome Space Mountain was with the kids. We were excited and we told them about the teacups with which is that ever-spinning horrible ride that they could ride on all they wanted, but their father would never step in. We told them about the haunted house, and that, that it was all a show, but it was a, a wonderful way for them to, to ride a ride and see some of the spectacular things that Walt Disney had created. We told them about its small world and how we could ride on this nice little water ride and see things. We told them about many of the rides, but the one that they heard about the most in advance was probably, you guessed, Space Mountain. They were so excited about riding Space Mountain. We talked about it all day as we went to other things, and finally we decided the time had come to go. And we walked over to where Space Mountain's line began. And as we began to stand there, we looked down, and there was a little sign that had a little person with an arm sticking over. And it said, if you're not this height, you're too small to ride. So a man and I walked by it, as quickly as possible, and Sydney walked by and looked over at it and was fine. Jordan walked by it and was close, and then came the boys. The boys walked over, and they were probably about this far from being tall enough to ride Space Mountain. As you can imagine, they were devastated. They both had just about an all-out meltdown. Their, their hopes dashed on the rocks of a, a stupid little sign that said that they could not enter that wonderful, wonderful roller coaster ride called Space Mountain. We promised them that someday we'd go back. We wandered away to some other ride. The day was not destroyed, but it was nowhere near as fun as we had imagined. The second day we were there, we went over to the Animal Kingdom, which was a new part of Disney that we had never been to, Amanda and I had never been to, and of course the kids had not been to Disney World before. 
But we went over to the animal kingdom because it had a water park and it, and it had foreign animals of things that they had never seen before in their lives. And yes, once again, it had other kinds of rides, including some roller coasters. As we walked around the animal kingdom, we saw different things, and we came to this ride that was called the dinosaur ride, is what I remember it to be. And everybody said that they wanted to ride the dinosaur ride, that it was an indoor roller coaster ride that, that all people could enjoy, that was not a height limit. And, and we got in line, and as we stood in line, we looked up on the walls to see images of, of dinosaurs, and, and there were holographic images of them coming out of the wall in our direction. As we stood there excited about the ride, we neglected to notice that the longer we stood there, one of our children became more and more terrified. As we got to the front of the line, as it was our time to step on that roller coaster and ride was a family together, Kenton freaked out. As he stood there in line with his fist clenched and he said, I am not riding that. And we didn't know what to do. People were in line waiting on us or waiting on us to get in the ride. And, and so after a while of him continuing to be upset and worried and, and concerned about this ride and his fear for his own life, I said to Amanda, y'all go ahead and ride and I'll take him back and we'll meet you at the exit. So as they went and jumped on the ride and began to ride the ride, I walked him back through the back way out of the line. And, and we went and got a little bit of candy. And I, I tried to comfort him and encourage him and tell him that it would be okay. He was still very, very upset. I'm not going to ride that over and over and over again. He said, I'm not going to ride that. He was overcome with fear. And there was no way I felt that he was going to ride it. When Amanda and Jordan and, Kent and Sydney and JT got off the ride, they began to talk about how much fun it was and that it wasn't scary at all. And they played it up in a way that we could tell. I could tell that they were trying to encourage him to take a leap of faith and ride that ride. But he didn't for a while. We went, as I remember, to grab some lunch and do a few other things. And later on in the day, Kenton finally said, you know what, I'll ride that ride. So I went and got in line with him, and we went and we got on it, and I will say that he was terrified when they sat down and they clenched him into it. And as it began to go, he, in the midst of the ride, he began to scream at the top of his lungs, Let me off! Let me off! Let me off! He was terrified, like it was the worst thing he had ever experienced in his life. He feared for his own life, it seemed. I knew that they weren't going to stop the ride and let us off, so I, I tried as best I could to encourage him and to comfort him in the midst of it. And, and throughout the whole ride, he continued to scream at the top of his lungs. Poor little kid. I learned at that moment that I was a terrible, terrible father. But as the ride began to come to an end, as you know rides like that end, there's this area where you can see the light and where people are waiting at the exit. And about the time that we crossed the threshold from the darkness of the ride itself into where people were waiting, Kenton's demeanor changed. As a matter of fact, as the, the roller coaster came to a stop, I remember him looking up at me and going, That was awesome! Can we do it again? And it was a seminal moment as I realized that he had overcome his fear and had learned sometimes things turn out okay. It was a wonderful, our trip to Disney World adventure for our family. As the whole time we were there, it included peaks and valleys and twists and turns. And we as a family grew so much closer because of that very trip. So I guess you're probably wondering, what does this have to do at all with our scripture lesson for today? Our lesson for today doesn't include a roller coaster per se. But it does share with us seemingly the highest, highest point in Peter's life. The top of the hill with the pinnacle of his journey of faith. You see, in our lesson today, Jesus, it says, is in the district of Caesarea of Philippi. It's obviously a Roman-occupied territory due to the name, first part of the name, including Caesar. Now, I don't know the significance therein and why Matthew mentions it. But maybe it's because he's about to make a point about who is the ruler of all humankind. 
So while they're there, Jesus asks the question of his disciples, who do the people, who do people say that I am? And the disciples respond with various popular prophets throughout Hebrew history and also their own modern version. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or maybe some other prophet, they reply. But Simon Peter, who tends to be the one with his foot in his mouth so often, says, You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. Wow. This time, Peter truly gets it right. His proclamation is a confession of faith. You're the one that the whole of history has been waiting for, Jesus. Jesus then calls Peter blessed. And he renames him the rock. The rock on which the church will be built. It will be so strong, Jesus says, that even hell cannot prevail against it. Jesus continues by saying, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you condemn on earth will be condemned from heaven. And whatever you set free on earth will be set free in heaven. Traditionally in art, Peter is shown with, two, with one of these two images or both of these images we find in our lesson today. Either a cornerstone or a rock or a key or both. Now I believe that a key is a much better image as Peter is the one who possibly opens the door to faith in Jesus. Or Peter, even as Jesus says, is the one that unlocks, unbinds those and sets them free in their faith. And I believe that there are so many negative analogies that can be conjured up when we talk about rocks. Rocks can do harm. Rocks can sink to the bottom of a body of water so quickly. Yes, rocks do form solid foundations. But they can move and they cause things to fall even on those solid foundations. Keys open the door to things. Rocks. They're just rocks. And yet, Jesus doesn't call Peter the key. He calls Peter the rock. This solid foundation on which the church will be built. Peter, of all things... This very same Peter, the one who two and a half short chapters ago in Matthew tried to walk on water and sunk like a stone cast into the water. This same Peter whose heart is in the right place, but sometimes it gets replaced by his brawn. To me, there's some wonderful irony that's found herein because Peter, of all things, is not solid. Shortly after our lesson today, this very same Peter is called, of all things, Satan by Jesus from trying to stop Jesus from persecution. And this same Peter will deny that he even knows Jesus during the tri Jesus' trial and crucifixion as he denies him not once, not twice, but three times. A rock, maybe a pebble, pebble skipped across the lake of life only to sink a few times after a few bumps along the way. And yet this very same Peter is the one to whom Jesus goes after his resurrection to affirm and challenge him with his words. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you truly love me? And this same Peter then garners the faith and the courage to stand up in the remaining followers of Jesus and begins to build the very church with his own leadership. This very Peter becomes the rock as his profession of faith or the very words from which the theological framework of the church has begun to unfold. Theodore, the 5th century bishop of Montpestua, understands Jesus' words to Peter as much as we Protestants generally do. When he says, Peter's confession is the rock on which the church is founded upon. Having said that his confession is a rock, he states that upon this rock I will build my church. 
This means that God will build his church upon the same confession of faith that Jesus is the son of the living God. And that's where it all starts. And that's where it all ends. The church will be built on the life of Jesus. On how he lived. On how he loved. On how he transformed broken lives. And especially on how he revealed God. The one true God. The living God to the world. The rock. The solid foundation is that Jesus is the embodiment of God. And Peter, blessed Peter, figured that one out first. But let's get back to roller coasters and life and faith. I believe that a roller coaster is a wonderful analogy for our lives and for our faith. As you know, roller coasters contain twists and turns and peaks and valleys and even breakneck speeds in addition to moments with which seems slower than waiting for homemade cookies to come out of the oven. Roller coasters, for most of us, involve sheer panic and terror, in addition to moments of pure joy and enthusiasm. And isn't life that way as well? And faith, I believe, is that way too. We may confess with all our hearts and even believe to the depth of our very soul that these wonderful words, these wonderful words, that Jesus is our Savior, and yet our world still continues to feel like a roller coaster as it peaks and valleys, as it twists and turns. And I must tell you, that's okay, even in faith. There are times where, if we're honest, we are cooking along in faith, and there are times when we are seemingly stuck in the mud. There are times where life is euphoric, and there are times where we just want to get off the ride. Brothers and sisters, life and faith can be very much like a roller coaster. Now, if I may, I would like to use Kenton's words for three brief points that I feel are important for us to learn from our lesson today. When we approach things in life, or even in faith, we may tend to respond like Kenton did at Disney's Dinosaur Roller Coaster. We may say, I'm not going to ride that. Or we may say, God, please let me off. Or maybe even sometimes we say, man, this is awesome. I believe that that's embodiment of all of how our faith should be. I'm not writing that. Yeah, those were the words of Kenton, and I believe that those words describe being overcome with fear and not having faith. I am sure that there were times in Peter's life and the rest of the disciples as well that they said, "This is I am. There's no way we can do this." When the disciples approached Jesus to feed the five thousand plus people, they were trying to hand it off to him, and Jesus said. You give them something to eat. How often in our own lives do we look at some challenge that we have? Whether it's illness, whether it's job opportunities, whether it's even the challenges that arise with raising children or learning how to train a dog. Do we step back and say, I'm not doing that. And yet God reminds us to trust and believe and buckle down for the ride that is to come. Kenton said, I'm not riding that, and yet he eventually stepped forth in faith and did, and it turned out to be a wonderful experience for him. But it wasn't even in the midst of the ride. I'll never forget his shrill shrieks of, let me off, let me off, let me off. And how many times have we felt that in our own lives? Especially in these last five months. We've wanted to push pause on the video of life or even eject and, and throw it away. And I'm sure that Peter wished to pause things in his own life. Or to put a stop to them. I'm sure that when Peter was arrested and eventually crucified upside down, he wanted off. 
And yet God reminds us over and over and over in Scripture and through the work of the Holy Spirit that no matter where we are and no matter what we face, what we face and whatever, no matter what fears or concerns we have, that God will be right there with us through it all. And God is. I know that these last number of months have been challenging for you. They sure have been for me. There have been many a time where I have just said, thrown my hands up and said, God, please, stop it all. And I don't know when there's going to be an end to it. But I know that someday when we look back, we'll know that we survived this amazing journey called life and faith. How often in your faith have you said the words, this is awesome? There are not a lot of pinnacle or seminal moments in our lives in faith sometimes. Jesus reminds us in our lesson today and in, in, in other places throughout Scripture that our lives are called to a greater purpose and a greater mission. And sometimes it means that we're on this roller coaster ride with twists and turns and peaks and valleys and and challenges of bitterness and frustration and anger all around us. And yet Jesus reminds us that there is a time that will come when we will no longer see suffering or hurt or pain in our world. And how beautiful and wonderful that day will be. How beautiful will that be when we are received by our Lord with open arms and we hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. We are called to a greater purpose, an awesome purpose of teaching the world the love of God embodied in this man, Jesus Christ. There's no more awesome a thing that we could be called to than that. Do you see the awesomeness in your own life and in your own faith? I know sometimes things get in the way. But God is doing wonderful things right here and right now. Right in front of you. And so our lesson begs me to ask you a question, the most important question that you can ever be asked. Who do you say and believe Jesus is? This question matters greatly for us as individuals, for if Jesus is the one for us, the one that we follow, the one that we seek to be like, then our lives are never, ever, ever the same as we seek to love and be compassionate and care and transform the brokenness of our world around us. But that question is also pertinent not just for us as individuals, but who do we as Jesus Christ, who do we believe Jesus is as a church? For us to move forward as followers of Jesus, to develop our mission, I believe, to love and to welcome and to nurture and to serve all people by following the example of Jesus, we must know that sometimes our lives are pinnacles of perfection and other times we are stuck deep in the mud of the valley. In order for us to move forward in life and in faith, we have to admit that sometimes there are curves that come out of nowhere. And even lots of times life seems to fly right past us. And also we, you see, have to admit that these are places where we, there are places where we find ourselves where we never ever wanted to be. And yet God is right there with us. Recently I saw a church sign and now, don't get me wrong, sometimes church signs are a bit off-putting to me, but this one was spot on, and it caught my attention. And I pulled over and I wrote down the words because I thought they were pertinent for me to share with you and to use in my own life these days. It said, to hear God turn down the world's volume. We're in the midst of a time, and we have an opportunity, I believe, to turn down or turn up the volume. I don't need to tell you that the world around us seems to be getting louder and louder. We have the choice as to who we listen to. We have the choice as well as to who will follow. We have the choice as to who as well we will believe in. 
Is Jesus the center of it all for you? I sure hope he is. The world will bring us changes, both those we welcome and those that are difficult. <clears throat> Children, we hope, will grow up and change. Economic circumstances and health are not solely matters of our own choice. We may lose people who are near and dear to us. But we have the power and the authority when we choose to cooperate with God's call to us. That call to be transformed. That call to do the work needed to exercise and develop good gifts. And that call to be changed by this new life that has been given and entrusted to us by Jesus. So where are you in this work of transformation? And where are we as a congregation? You see, life and faith are truly a roller coaster. It's an amazing and a terrifying ride all wrapped up into one. May you and I be thankful that God is with us all along the way. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, wherever life takes us, might we see you ever present with us along the way. Might we discover you of Lord of all things. And might you, we see you not continue, not just continually transforming our own lives, but the world around us. Bless us, Lord, as we experience the peaks and valleys, the twists and turns, the highs and lows. That in the midst of it, we might continue to see you as the one true God who saves us by your grace. It's in the name of Christ, the one who calls us all to be that rock on which he can be proclaimed. Amen.
I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at Ardmore. I hope you've been blessed by it as we've been live today rather than pre-taped. It's just our chance to share with you the gifts and graces and also to be more real because that's what life and faith is really about. No matter where you are in your journey of life or faith, whether you're in the peaks or in the valleys or in the twists and turns, no matter whether you don't want any more or just want to get off this ride, be reminded that Christ loves you so much that He gave everything in order that you might know what that true love is. And now live your lives in a way that embodies that love. Live love. Be compassionate. Because there's a world out there that so desperately needs to know God's love. So go forth, wherever you may find yourselves, and be that love for everyone.